There's not many series out there quite like Kero no Kyokai. For those not familiar with it, it's a supernatural mystery series written by Kinoko Nasu, the same author who would go on to write Tsukihime, Fate's Day Night, and Mahoyo, among much more. Kero no Kyokai was originally published as a series of light novels, and around 2007, they were adapted into a series of movies by Studio Ufotable. But of Nasu's works, Kero no Kyokai is perhaps his most niche. The series is far from underrated, but unless you're familiar with the wider Nasuverse, there's a good chance you might never have heard of it. And I wouldn't blame you. Type Moon has a reputation for being convoluted and confusing, and Kero no Kyokai is one of the reasons why their reputation exists in the first place. But don't let that reputation fool you. Kero no Kyokai might not be the most well-known series, but it's beloved by many for a reason. Many Type Moon works are known for their creative settings, rich world building, and fantastically written characters, and every single one of those things can be found in Kero no Kyokai. And if you're someone who hasn't seen the series, you're in luck. Some time back, I made a video about Kero no Kyokai that's geared towards series newcomers. There, you'll find a very brief, spoiler-free explanation of the series, and you can decide for yourself if it's something you might be into. Kero no Kyokai is the kind of series that appeals to fans of darker mysteries, character dramas, and weird, more experimental storytelling. If any of that sounds interesting, I encourage you to check out the series for yourself. So if you're someone who's unfamiliar with the series, consider this your first warning, because this is going to be a deep dive into Kero no Kyokai, spoilers and all. There's a lot to talk about with this series, like each film's standalone story, the greater overarching narrative, and the unique story structure of the series in general. And the beauty of it all is that it works so elegantly. Kero no Kyokai is a supernatural mystery series, but there's a genuine heart and soul underneath that makes it truly special. But before moving on, let's establish a few ground rules. For starters, there's going to be full spoilers moving forward. This includes all the movies, the OVAs, and the light novels. If you're curious why this video is almost as long as some of the films, well, that's why. There's just a lot to discuss all at once. And speaking of which, that brings up my second point, which are the Kero no Kyokai light novels. For the most part, the affordable films are good adaptations of the source material, and much of my focus will be on the adaptations. But like with any adaptation, the films do change and omit some parts of the original story. I'll talk more about the light novels in their own section, as the changes can vary from being really minor to radically changing entire stories. And lastly, we have the subject matter in question. Kero no Kyokai is a very dark series, and a lot of storylines involve sensitive topics that could be uncomfortable for some viewers. This includes topics like grotesque violence, suicide, and sexual assault. Personally, I won't dwell on these topics for too long at all, but it is an unavoidable part of these films. It's only fair to let you know ahead of time. But with all that out of the way, I could not be more excited to get into this series. Kero no Kyokai was my first entry into the vast ocean known as the Nasuverse, and it remains one of my favorite entries to this day. It's no secret that I'm a huge fan of Type Moon, and I've been planning on a series to discuss their works for some time now. And when it comes to the Nasuverse, it's only fitting to begin with the origin of it all. So before getting into the films, it's important to address the source material in question. Kero no Kyokai was originally published as a series of light novels, and sometime later, they were adapted into the films we see today. Broadly speaking, the adaptations are extremely faithful. Many of the story beats in the novels are adapted in the films, even down to their non-linear structure. And because the stories are largely identical, both the novels and films share similar strengths and weaknesses. When comparing the two, the film's biggest advantage is that it's a visual medium. Not only do the films look fantastic, but the visuals go a long way to cutting through the novel's density. Nasu's works are really verbose and the adaptations are able to use visual storytelling in lieu of long-winded explanations. I've always viewed Karen no Kyokai as like the anime equivalent to indie films, where they use things like visual metaphors or long stretches of quiet moments in order to tell the story. And for a series as dense and abstract as Karen no Kyokai, it's an approach that works really well, but the visual, show-over-tell approach doesn't work all the time. If there's any glaring weakness with the films, it's how they adapt the characters. Nasu's characters tend to be very introspective, and throughout the story, a lot of time is devoted to their inner thoughts and feelings about what's happening. And ultimately, this is the reason why many of his characters are so beloved. As we read through stories like Tsukihime and Fate, we're always aware of a character's fears, their insecurities, or those brief moments of joy within the story. The Karen no Kyokai novels are very similar in this regard. While Shiki is the main character of the series, the novels change point of views often, with many chapters devoted to supporting characters or antagonists. 
and as a result, almost every character in the novels gets fleshed out. Many of the stronger characters, like say, Shiki, are even more interesting in the novels, and the supporting cast is much more well-rounded. But when it comes to the film adaptations, a lot of the characters' inner monologues are cut, which is a change that affects some characters more than others. For example, Shiki comes across as much more human in the novels. She has moments where she feels awkward, upset, or conflicted, even when she looks calm and composed on the outside. But since her inner thoughts aren't as present in the films, she comes off as much more cold and aloof. That said, Shiki still gets constant focus throughout the films, and she remains one of the best characters. But the other characters aren't as lucky. This is something I'll go more in depth with each film, because so many stories are reliant on everyone's inner thoughts. For an adaptation, it does make sense to trim some inner monologues, but in Ufotable's case, it does more harm than good. The lack of inner monologues is one of the reasons why the films can feel confusing. There are many plot points or character moments that seem strange, jarring, or underdeveloped, and they feel that way because you're only getting half the story. In many Nasuverse works, inner thoughts are just as important as the main events of the story, if not even more important, especially in something as character-driven as Kare no Kyokai. But like I mentioned earlier, the cuts affect each film differently. Many of the more plot-driven ones, like say, movies 1 and 5, aren't affected as much. But the slower films, like movies 2 and 4, are much weaker compared to their novel counterparts. Those stories are much more introspective, and when you cut some of that introspection, you end up with a less interesting story. Again, I'll touch on this more when the time comes, especially with regards to movie 6, which is so different from the original story that it might as well be something else entirely. But moving forward, I want to mention that I'll still be looking at the films on their own merits. The light novels aren't exactly widely available, and it's never a good idea to judge an adaptation based on the source material anyways. Even the best adaptations have to make changes. But the films are not perfect, and many of their flaws, like weak character writing or underdeveloped plot points, are addressed more in the novels. I'll mostly be using the novels as a sort of reference point, like to explain some aspects of the films in more detail. And to cap off this section, I highly encourage fans of the series to check out the light novels. For the most part, the films remain a fantastic way to experience the series, and the novels make a great companion to read alongside the films, or to read after finishing the entire series. So, with the light novels addressed, let's get into the first film of the series, Kare no Kyokai 1, Overlooking View. As I mentioned earlier, Kare no Kyokai is a non-linear series, at least for the first half. Overlooking View is the first film in the series, but chronologically, it takes place right in the middle of the story. As a result, it's very common to have many questions going into this film, and potentially even more after the credits roll. The early confusion is intentional, and the films are structured in a way to slowly reveal information over time. Any questions you have are going to be addressed, whether it's in the next film, or the ones after that. On a first watch, Overlooking View feels like a window into a much wider world, with characters you aren't familiar with, and a sense of magic you don't quite understand yet. And for the first viewing, one of the best parts is unraveling how all the pieces connect together. The first half of this film is structured like a slow burn mystery, with every scene revealing new information to the audience. The film introduces the key characters, namely Shiki, Mikia, and Toku, followed shortly by supernatural phenomena, like specters, or Shiki's powers. I honestly have nothing but praise for the first half of this film. While not a lot actually happens, we're constantly learning about new aspects of this series, whether it's something about the characters, or learning about the magic that exists in this world. And by the final showdown, we have a much better understanding of both the world and the characters. But as much as I like the film's first half, it does falter a bit halfway. The second half is devoted to exploring the film's antagonist, Kiri Fujo, as well as checking in on Shiki and Mikia. The Shiki and Mikia scenes are good, especially on a second viewing once you're more familiar with their relationship. But the Kiri and Toku scenes are really dry. Kiri's entire backstory is delivered via narration, and it's not the most engaging way to flesh her out. Instead of Kiri explaining her backstory to the audience, it would have been much more effective to show her backstory alongside her narration, which is similar to what we see with other characters in later films. It'd go a long way to breaking up the monotony of the second half and making Kiri's fate much more impactful. In the end, it's fair to say that Overlooking View is a really good film, but not necessarily a great one, like a solid 7 out of 10. Ultimately, this film is only let down by its simplicity. Some of the series' strengths, like the animation and the atmosphere, are on full display, but there's just not enough there. Yet. Like a lot of films in this series, this movie gets much better once you're more familiar with the characters, whether it's on a rewatch or viewing the series in the chronological order. But for the first watch, you're only given a very brief glimpse into who these characters are. Shiki is a cold, aloof protagonist, protagonist of this operation. 
Toku is a skilled mage, and Mikia exists, I guess. And in addition, this film suffers from issues that plague the later films. For example, Karen no Kyokai has a tendency to get really philosophical, with many characters going on long-winded discussions about abstract concepts. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but when it comes to philosophical concepts, I'm of the opinion that less is more. It's always more effective to say less and let the audience come to their own conclusions. And this is something I think the films do really well, like for example, Toku's dialogue early in the film. This scene is a great example of when the films balance dialogue, visual metaphors, and philosophical concepts. It's not the only one either, and scenes like this are some of the best ways to adapt the novel's denser passages. At the same time, the films do tend to go overboard, like the dialogue scene in the hospital, or any of the other dialogues in later films. I don't sleep. I just dream. As much as I love this series, you could cut about a third of these diatribes without much loss. There's a thin line between being deep and philosophical and being pretentious, and this series tends to go back and forth between the two. But besides the dialogue, this film showcases one of the more noticeable flaws within the series, the mysteries. Where Karen Okioka excels is how it builds the mystery of the world. Overlooking View is a great introduction to both the characters and the urban fantasy of Type Moon, all of which are explored more with each film. But while the broader, overarching mysteries are really well done, the individual standalone stories are more hit and miss. A good mystery is reliant on giving the audience information throughout the story. Even before the mystery is resolved, we should have enough information to come to a conclusion, whether it's the correct one or not. And once the mystery is resolved, it feels like this huge epiphany. Holy mother forking shirt balls. If we were right, it feels like everything comes together in a satisfying, cohesive way. And if we were wrong, there should be enough information so that we can look back and see how the answers were always there, hidden in plain sight. It's the reason why something like, say, Saber's identity is such an awesome reveal in the fate route. Throughout the story, both the audience and Shiro are trying to figure out who she is. And the moment it's revealed, it hits us like a sack of bricks. It couldn't have been anyone else. And when you go back and reread the story, you can see all the clues that were there the whole time. And if you're like 90% of people and already know who Saber is, you can appreciate how well the novel builds up the mystery of her identity. Of course, writing a good mystery is a lot harder than it sounds. There's a tricky balance between giving the audience enough information, but not giving them too much which ends up making the resolutions feel really obvious. But when there's not enough information, the resolutions feel cheap, like the author is trying to trick the audience instead of building the mystery organically. Overlooking View only has one mystery, if you can even call it that. We already know who's behind the deaths, and the real mystery would be her motives and her method. But Kiri is an enigma for over half the movie, and we're not given any information on who she is or why she's doing this until much later. And by that point, the main conflict is already resolved. As a result, Kiri's backstory and motives end up a little unsatisfying, even on a rewatch. There's not really a puzzle there to solve. We basically get the entire picture all at once. And this is a similar issue that affects the later films, where plot threads and reveals happen with little to no foreshadowing. Now, this isn't to say all the films are like this, and many of the better stories have really well-written mysteries. But the weaker mysteries are a recurring trend for the series moving forward. At the same time, the mystery aspect is only one part of this series. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that Karen no Kyokai is a character drama first, and a mystery series second. There's less focus on the mysteries and reveals, and more focus on how those mysteries affect the characters, as we'll see soon enough. But all in all, Overlooking View is a great intro to this series. This movie's story is admittedly not the strongest, and it doesn't reveal too much about the main characters, or add too much to the overarching story in the series. But this movie works for what it's intended for, this film was like the pilot episode for the entire series, and it's meant to grab your attention and get you to start asking questions. If you finish this film and find yourself drawn into this world, then it did its job wonderfully, and there's a good chance you're going to enjoy the rest of the journey. Wow! Okay, it was good. That's so well done. Do we have time to watch one more, you think? I think so. Which brings us to the second film in the series, Murder Speculation Part 1. Chronologically, this is the first film in the series, and it's the first of the more expository films. This film was meant to fill in the gaps and answer some of the questions we might have had since the last entry, all while adding a few new questions as well. Murder Speculation 1 is best described as one part murder mystery and one part slice of life, with both threads intertwining by the end. 
The main plot revolves around a series of murders, all of which are connected to Shiki Ryogi somehow. Meanwhile, Mikio Kokuto befriends Shiki, and struggles with the fact that he may be falling in love with a murderer. This film serves as a real introduction to Shiki and Mikia, and in contrast to the last one, this film was a much slower, more introspective story that explores their characters in more detail. But the biggest reveal in this film is with Shiki herself, or rather, selves. It's revealed that Shiki actually has two personalities inside her, with each part expressing different aspects of her personality. The easiest way to explain it is that it's similar to the yin-yang of Taoism, where two halves form to make a complete person. Everyone has a capacity for both light and darkness, and Shiki Ryogi is a living example of that. But Murder Speculation 1 is a strange film to discuss because on its own, there isn't really that much to discuss. The film's main plot doesn't get resolved until much later, and when you ignore the plot, it's a fairly simple slice of life story. Similar to Overlooking View, Murder Speculation 1 is a film with a distinct purpose. This film was meant to shed light on Shiki and Mikia's relationship, while at the same time, laying out the story threads for later entries. For my own personal ranking, I'd give it like a 6 out of 10. It's not the most engaging film in the series, and it's not quite a complete story on its own, but it's necessary for this point in the series. However, Murder Speculation 1 is the first film that really suffers from a lack of inner monologues. This is the kind of story that revolves around inner thoughts and internal conflict, and when the inner thoughts aren't shown, the story just doesn't work as well. For the most part, Mikia's role is communicated decently, especially in the latter half. But even then, there are these weird omissions that would have been great additions to the film. For example, the films don't really highlight what it was that made Mikia fall for Shiki. The film alludes to Mikia falling in love at first sight, which is partially true. But in the novel, Mikia explains that it wasn't just a shallow feeling. He sensed that Shiki was someone teetering on the edge of an abyss, and if she's not careful, she'll fall in and lose herself. And as he explains, he wants to be there for her if something like that were to happen. It's a sentiment that ultimately becomes Mikia's driving force throughout the series, and I'm surprised something so important was left out of the film. As for Shiki, the novel version explores her inner conflict in much more detail. Shiki is someone who longs to be normal, to be an ordinary girl living a dull, ordinary life. But due to her abnormalities, she feels she can never have a normal life. Shiki isn't normal, and she believes nobody will ever accept her for who she is. That is, until she meets Mikia. To Shiki, Mikia is someone that makes her feel safe and happy, and someone who makes her feel as if she could be normal. And at the same time, when she's around him, she's afraid of opening up and hurting herself, or worse, hurting him. Shiki's entire conflict stems from her complicated feelings about herself, her natures, and her deepest desires, and it's something that isn't communicated very well in the adaptation. The films don't allude to Shiki's dreams until much later, but they're central to her character from the very beginning. Overall, I've always felt that Murder Speculation 1 was one of the weaker films, and reading the novels elaborated on why. This story is a character-driven story that relies on introspection, and when there's less introspection, the rest of the story feels disjointed, like you're missing context or information. But like with Overlooking View, this film works for what it's intended for. This film was designed to answer some of our questions, and it does that job well enough. After Murder Speculation 1 comes the third entry in the series, Remaining Sense of Pain, much like Overlooking View, this film is a return to the more standalone, episodic stories in the series. But Remaining Sense of Pain marks a turning point. This is when a lot of the exposition is taken care of, and the series can finally start exploring more interesting stories. Remaining Sense of Pain is the darkest film in the series so far, and it's in part to its central conflict. The main plot of this film revolves around Fujino Asagami, an assault victim hunting down the last of her assailants. And right away, you can get an idea of what kind of questions this film presents. What do you do when the line between right and wrong is blurred? And what happens when the villain of the story is also the victim? This film always struck me as the evolution to overlooking view in practically every way. The main story is engaging from start to finish, and the main antagonist plays a central role throughout the film. And unlike overlooking view, this film reveals sides of the characters we haven't seen yet. Up to this point, Chiki is still a bit of an enigma. Murder Speculation 1 explores her backstory and darker tendencies, while in overlooking view, she's cold and jaded. There were hints of Shiki's other feelings before, but Remaining Sense of Pain is where we see that at heart, Shiki is a good person. While she's instinctively drawn to death, she actually harbors a very deep appreciation for life. She spares Fujino not once, but twice, and goes as far as to eliminate the disease inside her, giving Fujino a second chance at life. Remaining Sense of Pain has an awesome combination of character moments, a compelling story, and one of the best antagonists of the series. It's an 8 out of 10, and it remains one of the best films in the series. The only major flaw with this film is how disjointed it is. 
Like the other films, this film hits all the main story beats in the novel, but the film version doesn't come together quite as well. The film glosses over a lot of the main events, and it leaves some plot points feeling underdeveloped, or in some cases, underwhelming. For example, the film briefly touches on Fujino's trauma, her guilt over the murders, and the source of her abdominal pain, but it doesn't explore these concepts in great detail either. In the film, the lingering mystery revolves around Fujino's abdominal pain. As Fujino's murders continue, she feels a combination of intense physical agony and a sensation of feeling alive. For most of the film, it's implied that her pain is a psychosomatic condition, like a manifestation of her trauma. But later in the film, it's revealed that Fujino has actually been suffering from appendicitis. She's been sick for some time now, but because she normally can't feel pain, her disease was never properly diagnosed. It's a reveal that's barely foreshadowed in the story, and in a way, it delegitimizes Fujino's trauma. Fujino already had a really compelling motive, and making the true source of her pain be an undiagnosed medical condition undermines her story. But in the novel, the reveal has a much stronger purpose. The novel spends a lot more time on Fujino's feelings throughout the story, and her fall from grace feels even more tragic and heartbreaking. In a way, she's someone who never really had a choice. She has no friends she can turn to, no family to rely on, and like Shiki, she feels as if she can never belong in the normal world. And by the midpoint, she's racked with guilt over her actions, even going as far as to wonder if she's just as vile as the people she's killing. And it all builds to a powerful resolution. During the final confrontation, part of her is begging for death, to escape from her sins, her guilt, and her pain. But at the very end, she realizes that she wants to live. Just like Shiki, Fujino wants to chase that dream of living a normal life. But because of her appendicitis, Fujino's dream is unreachable. She knows she's dying, and she feels that deep down, she doesn't even deserve to live. And then, Shiki saves her. Many of these points are in the adaptation, but again, the adaptation leaves out a lot of Fujino's inner thoughts. And while the film works just fine without them, the story is even better with the additional context. Remaining Sense of Pain is really Fujino Asagami's story, and so much of the story works once you have insight into how she's feeling. But in the end, Remaining Sense of Pain is still a great movie. Many of the flaws with this film are due to how it's adapted, and even then, the core story is still really solid. For me, this is when the series evolved from being good to being great. This film still has the flaws of its predecessors, but its strengths are more apparent than ever. Next, we have the fourth film in the series, Hollow Shrine. Chronologically, Hollow Shrine is the second film in the timeline, and it serves as a direct follow-up to Murder Speculation 1. And like Murder Speculation 1, this film is another expository film. Hollow Shrine is the last non-linear film, and it's meant to clear up any remaining questions we've had up to this point. The film takes place shortly after Murder Speculation 1, with Shiki being taken to a hospital following an accident. The accident left Shiki in a coma for two years, and when she wakes up, she notices something's changed. There are gaps in her memory, and she no longer feels the presence of her other personality. And more noticeably, she's awakened something called Mystic Eyes, a special power that lets her see the lines of death in all things. Similar to Murder Speculation 1, there isn't really much of a plot with Hollow Shrine. This film is meant to address things like how Shiki's powers work, and how she came to meet Miss Blue's sister, all of which is explored here. It's not the most action-packed story, and it's not that heavy on plot developments either. It's fair to give this one another 6 out of 10. At the same time, it's not really fair to judge this film on its own. It doesn't really work as a standalone story, and like Murder Speculation 1, it's more like a bridge between all the films in the series. Hollow Shrine is like the final piece of the puzzle, and with the answers this film gives, it adds so much context to the entire series as a whole. Shiki isn't just an aloof protagonist anymore, she's someone who quite literally lost part of herself, and she struggles with that constant feeling of emptiness within her soul. Hollow Shrine isn't the strongest film in the series, but it's another film with a specific purpose. This film wraps up almost every major question so far, and by this point, there's only a handful of mysteries left to unravel, all of which will be addressed in time. Coming after Hollow Shrine is the fifth film, Paradox Spiral. This film was generally regarded as one of the best in the series, if not the best, and I absolutely agree with that sentiment. I remember loving this film the first time I watched it, and I've only grown to like it more ever since. Paradox Spiral can best be described as two stories, both of which weave together into one by the end. The first story revolves around Shiki and Tomo Enjo, a runaway who stays with Shiki after murdering his parents. Meanwhile, Mikia and Toku are investigating a mysterious apartment complex, the same complex that Tomo seems to have fled from. And as both stories intertwine, they build into a much grander conspiracy involving puppets, a magical building, and powerful mages. If that sounds like a lot going on, then you'd be right. 
Paradox Spiral has one of the most complicated stories in the series, and unlike past films, it's not a slow burn. The film begins with one mystery, only for that mystery to splinter off into dozens more as the story progresses. This movie can be difficult to follow at times, and it's in part due to the plot and how the plot unravels over time. But as weird and confusing as this movie can be, what makes it work is the character of Tomo Enjo. Every major character so far has had some sort of special ability, with the exception of Mikia. But Tomo is the first time we see a normal person, and a normal person who comes face to face with things beyond their understanding. He's not brave, he's not intelligent, and he's not special in any way. He's a normal human being in way over his head. And as we learn in the film, he's not even human. The person known as Tomo Enjo died a long time ago, and the Tomo we see is a puppet. All of his memories and feelings were manufactured, and his sole purpose was to lure Shiki into the building. But in spite of all he's been through, he grows and changes, and he's content with the fact that he was alive. He existed, and for him, that was all that mattered. And while it seems small and meaningless, it was his actions that led to Shiki's victory at the end. And while Tomo is a great character, Paradox Spiral is a film where everyone gets a chance to shine. This is the first film where Shiki bonds with someone besides Mikia, and it's the first indicator that she's really growing as a person. Mikia gets to play a central role in the story. And finally, this film shows us the full extent of Toku's abilities. The films have alluded to Toku's magical talents before, but this is when the veil is lifted, and her true powers are on full display. However, I'd say the only aspect where the film falters is with the antagonist. Cornelius Alba is the film's secondary villain, and while he works as a good foil to Toku, his characterization is fairly weak in both the novel and the film. But Arya Soren is a more interesting case. Soren is both the main antagonist of this film, and the main antagonist of the entire series, or one of them, depending on your point of view. But for being such an important antagonist, he barely has a presence in the series. The first clue about its existence comes in a remaining sense of pain, and later, it's revealed that he's been pulling the strings all along. Paradox Spiral is when he finally reveals himself and explains what he's been doing. In short, his goal is to reach the Akashic Records, which in English, are the source of all human knowledge. That about sums up his goals in the film, which ends up feeling really underwhelming for such a major antagonist. But like with most parts of the series, Soren's motives are explained more in the novel. The novel explains how Soren was an idealistic person at one point, and he wanted to believe in a just world where good people could find happiness. But through his life experiences, he realized that was impossible. Suffering and death affect all of humanity, and try as he might, he couldn't save everyone. Instead, the only thing he could do was search for an answer, a reason why humanity suffered so much. If he could find that answer, then maybe he could give meaning to every death throughout human history. But Soren is over 200 years old, and so much time has passed that he no longer remembers why he started his journey. All Soren remembers is the end goal, and he wouldn't remember his original motivation until the very end of his life. It's a similar concept that Nasa would use in characters like Archer, and it adds a lot more depth to Soren's character. The film does touch on his original motives, but only very briefly compared to the novel. At the same time, this omission is one of the more understandable ones. Paradox Spiral is the longest novel in the series, and the movie is almost two hours long as is. One way or another, something was going to be left out. Overall, Paradox Spiral is an easy 9 out of 10 for me. It suffers from being a little convoluted, and having fairly weak antagonists, but this is one of the best standalone stories in the series. The mystery is the most engaging and well-written one so far, and to top it off, there's a real emotional core that ties it all together. And this is an awesome film to revisit once you're more familiar with the Nasuverse. Paradox Spiral is the first film that really expands on the world, and it mentions a lot of concepts that seem really confusing at first, like the Root, or the Counterforce, both of which are huge deals in stories like Fate and Mahoyo. Paradox Spiral is awesome. This is a treat for fans of weird, trippy mysteries, and for fans of the Nasuverse as a whole. Following after Paradox Spiral is the sixth entry, Oblivion Recording. While Paradox Spiral is usually considered to be the best film in the series, this one is usually considered to be the weakest. The main plot of this film follows Mikia's sister, Asuka, as her and Shiki investigate fairies at a girl's academy. The students are reporting waking up with gaps in their memory, and it's up to Asuka and Shiki to discover who's behind it. Now, this one stands out for being the biggest departure from the source material. The films always did omit content from the novels, but they still followed the main plots very closely. But the Oblivion recording adaptation makes a lot of changes from the original novel, so much that the film and novel might as well be considered separate stories. The main mystery in the film revolves around the fairies, a student named Misaya Oji, and Misaya's connection to another student's attempted suicide. 
Over the course of the story, it's revealed that Misaya is a source of the fairies, with her main motive being revenge against one class in the school. One of Misaya's close friends, Tachibana, became addicted to drugs that were given to her by another teacher. News of the incident spread like wildfire, but instead of trying to help, everyone in Tachibana's class stood by and said nothing, leading to Tachibana attempting suicide. In response, Misaya confronts the teacher involved and kills him, and following the murder, she decides to use fairy magic to kill everyone else in Tachibana's class. But later in the film, it's revealed that Misaya actually didn't kill the teacher. In reality, the teacher suffered from a heart attack. Misaya's memory of the events were actually taken from her, and she was misled into believing she killed the teacher. The real mastermind was another teacher by the name of Satsuki Kurogiri, a man who has the power to manipulate memories. Kurogiri is the one who rewrote Misaya's memory, but just before Misaya is able to follow through with her revenge, Asuka and Shiki figure it out and put a stop to it. While the core mystery is fairly interesting, it's ultimately lit down by a really weak resolution. The final reveal of Misaya's innocence is honestly really cheap, and it undermines the entire mystery of the story. And Kurogiri's role is just as underwhelming, as his entire reason for manipulating Misaya was to entertain himself. So it leaves the film in a weird place, because the initial mystery is really interesting. But as the movie continues, it wraps up in a really unsatisfying way, with both an underwhelming final twist and an underwhelming antagonist. Meanwhile, the other parts of the film aren't much better. Asuka is not a compelling character at all, and Shiki is barely involved in the main story until the end, when she confronts Kurogiri and gets her memories back. I wouldn't call Oblivion Recording a bad movie, but it is a really boring one. It starts out strong, but unravels in a really unsatisfying way. In addition, it's very disconnected from the overall series. The film doesn't reveal anything new about the characters, and it doesn't add much to the overarching narratives. Oblivion Recording is a 5 out of 10. It's my least favorite film in the series, and I usually skip it on a rewatch. However, all these critiques are only with the film adaptation. Oblivion Recording might be the weakest film, but the novel is actually one of the best in the series. The main premise of the novel is similar to the film, with Asuka and Shiki investigating the Rain Academy. Their investigation leads to Misaya Oji, who's connected to a much larger web involving Class 1A, Tachibana, and the teacher Hideo Hayama. But around the midpoint, Mikia does some investigating into the faculty, and he reveals that Hayama was actually the leader of an underground prostitution ring. All of Class 1A were involved, and the reason why they refused to help Tachibana was because they didn't want the secret getting out. Eventually, Tachibana is driven to suicide by guilt, shame, and immense distress. Misaya is devastated by the news, but it doesn't take her long to connect all the dots for herself. Sometime later, Misaya confronts Hayama and kills him, and just like the film, she resolves to kill all of Class 1A for standing by and doing nothing. But while those changes are drastic enough, the biggest difference is with Satsuki Kurogiri, whose backstory and motives are explored in more detail. In short, Kurogiri was cursed by fairies as a child, and the incident left him unable to form new memories. He can recall things like words, phrases, and other data, but his brain can't recall the visual images that make up our memories. But because of the incident, he learned the magic of memory manipulation, and he uses that power to extract the memories of others and learn more about the world around him. But since Kurogiri cannot form any new memories, one of the only ways he can find purpose is to grant the wishes of others. His powers allow him to see into another's memories, and once he observes someone's memories, he gives them a means to fulfill their deepest desires even if those desires are harmful to others or themselves. Later in the story, it's revealed that Kurogiri is the reason why Tachibana committed suicide. Like any distressed student, Tachibana sought a teacher for guidance, and Kurogiri presented a solution that aligned with her desires. Tachibana wanted to be free from her pain, and Kurogiri gave her a way to do just that. But all of that is only the tip of the iceberg. One of the biggest plot points in the light novel is the relationship between Misaya and Kurogiri, in the first half of the story, Misaya believes that she and Kurogiri are related somehow. Misaya was adopted by a wealthy family at a very young age, and she has faint memories of a brother she's been separated from. Once Misaya learns how to use fairy magic, she peers into Kurogiri's memories, and to her surprise, she finds memories of their childhood together. Misaya believes that Kurogiri is the man she was searching for, and she's motivated both by revenge and love for her older brother. But the final twist of the story is that it was all a fabrication. The story explains that after Misaya killed Hayama, she turned to her teacher Kurogiri for guidance. So like with Tachibana, Kurogiri did what he could to grant her wish. Kurogiri taught Misaya fairy magic, giving her the power she needed for her revenge. 
and because of Misaya's desire to find her long-lost sibling, she implanted her own feelings on memories that were never hers. The true nature of Misaya and Kurigiri's relationship is actually fairly ambiguous, but Misaya's feelings made her see what she wanted to see. Misaya desperately wished to find her brother, and Kurigiri filled that role perfectly. Misaya crafted this perfect fantasy for herself, where she found her long-lost brother, taught herself fairy magic, and is able to use that magic to exact her revenge. But in reality, Kurogiri taught her fairy magic, and he's the one behind Tachibana's suicide. Asuka eventually figures all of this out, and during the final confrontation, she explains everything to Misaya. But deep down, Misaya always knew. She knew Kurogiri manipulated her, and she knew that he never cared for her. But to Misaya, it was far better to live in a comforting lie than to face the harsh reality of everything around her. It's such a raw moment in the novel, but that isn't the end of the story either. Sometime later, Misaya sneaks into Kurigiri's office and kills him, finally getting the revenge she sought for from the beginning. I know that was a lengthy and possibly confusing explanation, but that's just how the events of the novel are. Oblivion Recording is actually the second longest novel, and it's one of the most engaging, multi-layered mysteries in the series. And not only is the story way better, but the main characters are just as good. Shiki's role is still relatively minor, but it's important nonetheless. Oblivion Recording is sort of the culmination of Shiki's arc up until now. Ever since her accident, she's been slowly healing, and it's here where she feels as if she isn't as empty as she used to be. She's content for the first time in a long time, and while she's still haunted by the gaps in her memory, she's willing to move on and move forward with her life. This changes when Kurogiri confronts her. Just like the film, Arya Soren ordered Kurogiri to return Shiki's memories. But Shiki doesn't want this at all. She's afraid those memories will open up too many wounds for her. She begs Kurigiri to leave her memories alone, but because of his powers, Shiki is helpless, and her memories are restored. And while the film version of Asuka is really lackluster, the novel version of her is fantastic. Asuka actually shares a lot in common with characters like Akiha and Rin, like their intellect, determination, and deep-seated insecurities. A lot of Asuka's inner conflict is her being worried that something is wrong with her, as if there's something inside her making her feel the way she does. Asuka believes that if she can find the right memories, she can find an answer to her inner turmoil. If either the characters or plot sound really interesting, it's because it is. Oblivion Recording is a great story, but the film version is a really, really pale imitation. The story and characters are extremely watered down, and the film doesn't add anything to compensate. The film adaptation feels like an hour-long filler, because in the end, it really is just a side story with little importance to the main series. There's over a dozen ways a film adaptation could have been improved, like fleshing out both the antagonists, or retaining some of the plot threads from the novel. But at the very least, the film should have focused more on Shiki and her memories. Shiki's memories have only been a focus in one other movie, and this would have been a great opportunity to explore it before the next film. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure what the thought process was behind this adaptation. It seems as if Ufotable wanted to censor it, which is strange considering the subject matter of previous films. And it's also quite short for such a long story. If I were to guess, I think the intent of this film was to serve as a breather between the other entries. As you might have noticed, Oblivion Recording is one of the darkest stories in Kara no Kyokai, and having movies 5, 6, and 7 back to back would be really heavy. It's the only explanation that makes sense, and even then, it doesn't excuse the film being so uninteresting, to put it nicely. The story behind what happened here is something we'll probably never know. And it's a real shame, because the film could have been just as good as the novel. The most we know is that the director of this film went on to head the Unlimited Blade Works adaptation. And, well, let's just say there's no such thing as coincidence. But coming after that is the seventh film in the series, Murder Speculation Part 2. As you could guess from the title, this film serves as both the conclusion to Murder Speculation 1 and the finale of the entire series so far. Murder Speculation 2 takes place shortly after Oblivion recording and a new series of murders have started in Mifun City. The murders bear some similarities to the ones that took place years ago, leading to Shiki and Mikia conducting their own investigations. Next to Paradox Spiral, Murder Speculation 2 is generally considered to be one of the best films. And for the longest time, if you were to ask me about my favorite film in the series, I would have answered with this one, with zero hesitation. I once wrote about Karen no Kyokai for a film class in college, and this film was actually the main topic of my discussion. But as much as I like this film, this is probably the one my opinion has changed on the most. I'll be upfront and say that while I still think this film is really good, it suffers from two issues that have plagued the series so far. The lackluster mystery writing, and the shaky character adaptation. There's a few other issues, like the dialogue and the pacing, but these two are definitely the ones that affected the most. 
Murder Speculation 2 is where all of our questions are answered. Some of the lingering threads so far are questions like, what happened before Shiki's accident? How was she involved with the murders from four years ago? And lastly, who is the one behind the murders now? And the film starts off strong. Three years ago, it's revealed that Shiki purposely threw herself into an oncoming car, because to her, she would rather die than harm someone who is very special to her. But instead of dying, Shiki's other personality died instead, leaving her soul damaged since then. It's a really good reveal, and it lines up with everything we know about Shiki so far. And you could say similar things about the second reveal, which is that Shiki had no involvement with the previous murders. Shiki was around the crime scenes, but that's just because she's drawn to them. Up to this point in the series, Shiki hasn't killed a single person, and if anything, it would have been out of character for her to do so. But later in the film, it's revealed that the true killer was Leo Shirazumi, a former student from Mikia and Shiki's high school. And while the other reveals have been fairly solid, this one is a bit of a mixed bag. On one hand, it's not something you could have seen coming. Leo is a character who's barely been in the series so far. You could probably count all his appearances on one hand. But at the same time, because he's appeared so little, it makes his reveal a little too obvious. When you're watching the series, you get to scenes of this random character who hasn't appeared very much at all. So when you finally get to this film, it almost makes his appearance a foregone conclusion. It had to have been that character, because there simply wasn't anyone else it could have been. Either way, it makes for a pretty unsatisfying reveal. Part of building a mystery involves tricking the audience, but doing so in a way that feels fair and interesting. And in Leo's case, it's in this weird sort of middle ground, where you're either not given enough information, or you figure out the mystery anyways in this metagamey, roundabout kind of way. It's like how you can watch an episode of CSI or Law & Order, and the real perpetrator always ends up being that person you saw in the beginning of the episode. Oh, it's so obvious. He's the biggest guest star on the episode. If his name comes before the opening credits, he did it. Leo shares a similar problem with Arya Sorin, where he could have used just a bit more foreshadowing prior to this film. It would have made his later reveal a bit more obvious, but at the same time, there'd be more clues for the audience to connect the dots beforehand. Like Sorin, Leo is one of the main villains of the entire series, and for such an important antagonist, one film and a handful of scenes isn't quite enough. In any case, Leo's reveal presents a dilemma for the other characters. A good comparison for this film would be something like, say, The Killing Joke, or The Dark Knight, where the main conflict revolves around what lines the characters are willing to cross. Leo's goal throughout the series was to get Shiki to show her true colors, and he hoped that someday, Shiki would embrace her nature as a killer. But Shiki has always refused to cross that line, and as Leo's murders continue, she's pressured even more to put a stop to it. And on the other side, we have Mikia, who values life and believes everyone can be saved, no matter what. A monster like Leo is the ultimate test for both Shiki and Mikia's ideals, and it all builds into a powerful climax. Mikia confronts Leo and realizes just how far he's gone, and it's an act that almost costs him his life. And after resisting for so long, Shiki is finally pushed to her limit and kills Leo. The final scenes are easily some of the most powerful moments in the entire series. Shiki is forced to take a life, but she does so out of love and grief. And just when she's at her lowest, Mikia finds her and comforts her. In the end, you couldn't ask for a better way to end the series. After so long, Shiki is finally able to realize her dream. And now, she can move forward living a normal, ordinary life. But as amazing as the ending is, it is only one part of the film. Murder Speculation 2 starts and ends strong, but the middle parts of the film are very hit and miss. This film is two hours long, and unlike other films in the series, this is the one where you can really feel that runtime. A lot of the middle chunks are either character moments, toku dialogues, or an extended drug subplot that really drags. And it's not all a negative, as some of the best parts of this film are the character moments. And this is a film that really explores important Nasuverse concepts, like origins, which add a lot of insight into characters like Shiki, Asuka, and Leo, just to name a few. But like with other films, this one also goes overboard with the philosophy, and while the main plot is engaging, the drug subplot isn't. It takes up a lot of screen time, and while it does eventually lead Mikia to Leo, Mikia explains that he already figured out who the killer was anyways. And all this is fine the first time you watch this film, because on the first viewing, you're watching to see how it all ties together. On a first watch, it's interesting to see what role Shiki's memories play in the murders, as if there's some secret she's been hiding all this time. Then you find out she was never really involved, and while it adds a lot to her character, it ends up feeling like an extended bait and switch. And on the first viewing, the drug plot is really unique and really interesting, and you're waiting to see how it connects to the overall story. Except by the end, all it did was get Mikia from point A to point B in a really boring way. 
I know all of this sounds really critical of this film, and trust me, that's not my intent. Murder Speculation 2 was my favorite film in the series for years, but over time, a lot of its flaws became more noticeable. But even though my opinion of this film faltered, I can never quite pinpoint why. I knew the mysteries were underwhelming, and I knew the film's pacing wasn't the greatest, but there was always something else I couldn't quite articulate, and I wouldn't really figure it out until I finally read the light novels. Like with the other adaptations, the film and novel have identical storylines, and the novel has many of the same flaws as the film, like the overabundant philosophy and the underwhelming mystery elements. But the biggest difference between the two is how the characters are adapted. Murder Speculation 2 is a very character-driven story, and almost all of the conflicts are internal, dictated by a character's inner thoughts and inner feelings. And when you cut some of those inner thoughts, it makes the adaptation feel off, as if you're only getting part of the whole story. Earlier, I mentioned how the mystery of Murder Speculation 2 isn't the best, and that still holds true in the novel. But the novel is much more upfront about this, almost to the point where it feels self-aware. For example, in the novel's first two chapters, Shiki's innocence is revealed much earlier. Part of her still believes that she might be the original killer, but it's framed more as a symptom of her doubts and insecurities. By this point, she has all her memories back, so there's even more evidence to suggest that she's been innocent the whole time. But since she's had murderous thoughts before, she's not sure if she can trust herself or her memories. In contrast, the film is structured much more ambiguously, as if it's trying to mislead you into believing that Shiki might still be the murderer. There's no definitive proof towards Shiki's innocence until Leo's reveal, which doesn't happen until almost an hour into the film. And speaking of Leo, when he is revealed as the killer, he mentions that he never left any clues behind, with the exception of a single clue in a previous novel. For some reason, this scene was kept in the film, but the actual clue in question never made it to the Paradox Spiral film. But from what I could tell, the novel version of Murder Speculation 2 is less focused on the mystery, and more focused on how the mystery affects the characters. It seems aware that its mystery isn't the strongest, so instead, it focuses on each character's internal conflict. Much of Shiki's inner conflict is similar to the film's, except with additional monologues that shed light on her actions. In the first half of the story, Shiki experiences something akin to a relapse, and she begins an emotional spiral due to the ongoing murders. Even though she's made so much progress in healing, she's worried that she might lose herself and accidentally hurt Mikia, just like she almost did before. And like the other antagonists, Leo is fleshed out much more in the novel as well. He comes across as a much more tragic figure, and his struggles are similar to characters like Shiki and Fujino. But instead of trying to live a normal life, Leo attempts to bring others into his world. And in the end, this is the reason for the drug subplot. Leo created the blood chip in hopes that he could find someone just like him. If someone took the blood chip and survived, it meant that he found someone truly extraordinary. But he never did find anyone that could survive, and the only thing the blood chip did was add more to Leo's body count. But above all, the character who gets shafted the most is Mikia Kokuto. For the longest time, I never liked Mikia. I always thought he served an important narrative purpose, but that was it. He never had anything interesting to say, and he never did anything interesting either. He was bland, he was boring, but the story just doesn't work without someone like him. I always felt he was a good character, but needed just a little bit more to become a great character. And color me surprised, because that's exactly the case in the light novels. The difference between film Mikia and novel Mikia isn't massive, but it's just enough to make the novel version a fantastic character. Next to Shiki, Mikia has the most point of view chapters in the series, and one of the biggest changes is just how human he feels. Novel Mikia gets annoyed at little things, he gets angry at what's happening, and perhaps my favorite of all, he's got a little bit of a sarcastic streak. Some of my favorite parts of the novels are when he purposely teases Shiki, like he knows exactly what to say to annoy her in a playful way. And the same goes for Shiki as well. In the films, I've always felt that Mikia and Shiki's dynamic was lacking. They obviously love each other, but there's not that many scenes that explore the dynamics of their relationship. And that is not the case in the novels. Mikia and Shiki have a lot more back and forth throughout the series, and they act like an old married couple even before they get together. They tease each other constantly, and their dynamic is easily one of my favorite parts of the novels. And not only is Mikia's dynamic with Shiki more fleshed out, the novels also explore his worldviews in more detail. Every novel so far has presented difficult questions for Mikia, and Murder Speculation 2 is the final test for him. Leo Shirozumi is someone Mikia knew personally, and throughout the story, Mikia is trying to figure out if there's a way he can be saved. But every time he thinks he has an answer, someone tells him otherwise, and he's at a loss once again. And at the very end, Mikia's stubbornness almost kills him. Shiki and Toku were right, Leo was too far gone to have been saved, and in stark contrast to his normal good nature, he ends the story cursing Leo for how much he hurt Shiki. 
but the films really, really drop the ball when it comes to Mikia. And while it's excusable for the other characters, he's arguably the most important character in the series. Mikia is a character that works best once you know what he's thinking, and when you remove most of his inner thoughts, all you're left with is a bland, uninteresting character whose actions either come off as naive or downright stupid. If any of that sounds familiar, trust me, I know. Mikia suffers from a severe case of Shiro Syndrome, which is when a character loses a lot of depth due to how they're adapted. Both of the Kokotos got really shafted in the films, but I think Mikia got the worst deal. Murder Speculation 2 is his story just as much as it's Shiki's, and the story just doesn't work as well without both halves. All the films suffer in some way from cutting inner monologues, but I'd say Murder Speculation 2 is the one that's hit the hardest. This story relies on exploring every character's point of view and watching how they struggle with their ideals. And yeah, a lot of the characters' inner conflicts are in the adaptation, but watching the film is like getting the bullet points of the story. You'll understand the main ideas, but you're missing out on depth, context, and nuance that adds to the experience. Many of the best parts of this film are when it focuses on a character's inner conflict, and the film would be even better if it had more of that throughout the movie. In the end, I'd rate Murder Speculation 2 a 7 out of 10. I know this seems low for this film, and trust me, I get it. The ending is amazing, and if I judged it on just the ending, it'd be the easiest 10 out of 10 I could ever give. But there's more to a film than just its ending. The film is 2 hours long, and honestly, it doesn't use that runtime well at all. And the thing is, the story somewhat justifies the long runtime. The novel isn't as long as some of the others, but it is slow and introspective. I could easily see a version of this film where they cut some dialogues, or added back in some of the more relevant ones, like Shiki's insecurities, Mikia's self-doubts, or some of the banter with Mikia and Shiki. The very end of the film is meant to be a callback to all the times Mikia would tease Shiki, and it's in that moment where they finally feel that everything is going to be okay. But something like that is difficult to communicate in an adaptation, and it's even more difficult if the characters aren't as fleshed out beforehand. But as critical as I was with this film, there's no denying how perfect the ending is. For a series as dark as Kara no Kyokai, it's beautiful that it ends with Shiki's own happily ever after. But as beautiful as the ending is, it's not the only ending to the series. There isn't too much to say about Kara no Kyokai's epilogue. Whenever I think about the ways to adapt Nasu's writing, the epilogue is one of the best examples of how to not do it. It feels a lot like his long-winded passages about lore, world building, and philosophy, and it's not nearly as interesting as it sounds. The epilogue is good for lore implications and world building, and it's great to get more insight into concepts like the root or how Shiki was created. But even the most diehard fans would admit that the epilogue is very dry. The epilogue is a cool experience the first time, but I almost always skip it on a rewatch. And that brings us to the 8th and final film in the series, Future Gospel. Extra Chorus is best described as a series of side stories, while Future Gospel itself is more or less another epilogue to the series. However, there isn't that much to say about Future Gospel. The stories aren't bad by any means, but I wouldn't call them groundbreaking either. Future Gospel was released about 4 years after the series ended, and when it first released, it was awesome getting a chance to revisit the world and the characters. At the same time, Future Gospel is a film I never have a strong desire to revisit. And it's not really this film's fault either. Murder Speculation 2 is just too perfect of an ending. For me, most series rewatches end there, while the epilogue and Future Gospel are nice extras. Future Gospel gets about a 6 out of 10 for me. It's like the El Camino of Karen no Kyokai. It's good, but it's an epilogue to a story that already had a fantastic ending. And now that we're at the end, this is my own personal ranking of both the films and the light novels. Again, don't take these too seriously, it's just to help compare the stories against one another. Alright, I know this was quite lengthy, and I hope you'll believe me when I say that wasn't my plan. My original plan was to discuss the films only, like where they succeed and where they falter. But when I finally got around to reading the light novels, I realized that they addressed pretty much every critique I could think of. If something felt off in the films, like the way a character was acting, or any weird plot points, the novels would explain why it felt off. The adaptations have the benefit of sublime animation and a phenomenal score, but from a story perspective, they aren't perfect. They're cryptic and confusing to a fault, and while the character writing is great at many points, not every character is written equally. And the more I think about it, the more I think that Kara no Kyokai was affordable as lightning in a bottle. Kara no Kyokai is a series that lends itself well to visual storytelling, and the music and animation work with the mysterious plots in harmony. But at the same time, you can see the same issues that would go on to plague the later Ufotable adaptations. Visual storytelling is a powerful tool, 
but it's not the only one available. You need a balance showing and telling, and when it comes to Nasu's writing, visual storytelling alone just doesn't cut it. Ufotable gets a lot of criticism for how they adapted Unlimited Blade Works and Heaven's Feel, and if the Kara no Kyokai novels were as popular or widely available, I'm sure the films would have been criticized just as much. But as critical as I've been with this series, in the end, it's still one of my favorites. The adaptations aren't perfect, but there's also nothing else quite like them. They're weird, confusing, and experimental, and you have to applaud the films for at least trying something new. Kara no Kyokai will probably never reach the same widespread appeal as other type moon works, but that's okay. It's the definition of a cult classic, and it'll always have its fans out there. And as far as adaptations go, Kara no Kyokai is fairly complete. There's no major cuts or omissions in the main story, and while there is one unadapted novel, it's just another side story. Kara no Kyokai is as complete as it gets, and other adaptations wish they were so lucky. And for all the series' faults, Kara no Kyokai was never about the mysteries or the magic. I've been calling this series a mystery series, or supernatural fantasy, but at heart, Kara no Kyokai was always a character study. It's the story of a girl cursed by an existence she never wanted, and while she loses so much, she's able to overcome that loss and heal. She helps others, forms meaningful friendships, and eventually starts a family of her own. Shiki Ryogi is the heart and soul of Kara no Kyokai. Her journey and growth was my favorite part of the series when I first watched it, and honestly, it's going to remain my favorite in all the years to come.